Hello everyone, uh, I would like to introduce to you Nurchan Wilmas from the Netherlands. Nurchan focuses in restorative and aesthetic dentistry and today she will share with us a case about how to approach a case with dental wear. Welcome. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much uh, Christiana. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining this amazing group uh, with dentists um, that you give us, um, yeah, well, actually, maybe I'm not the youngest anymore, but that you gave us a platform uh, to share um, our knowledge, but also our mistakes and the steps that we take in every case uh, together with a big audience. And indeed, I'm going to uh, tell you in a short like period of 40 minutes about a case that I treated and where I really wanted to show the steps that I made, uh, maybe not fully in detail, but even though you still see a lot of details, um, but I want to show the mistakes that I made as well. So that's something I want to share. And I hope that the ones that don't approach cases like this have uh, some extra knowledge to maybe do it and the ones that already are doing a lot of these cases please feel free to shoot at my case because of course with every step i get or whatever advice i get i become stronger wonderful so, so uh yeah let's take a look thank you very much see you then bye bye so uh, first of all, thank you very much for Network for asking me to uh, take a little bit of your time and killing some of your time during this Corona uh, crisis. Uh, thank you very much for becoming a member of Network. And what I wanted to do uh, in this small lecture about a case presentation is uh, tell you some of my mistakes, but also the planning that I've made for this patient. Um, what we want in daily life is seeing patients like this because when we are seeing patients when we are seeing patients like this we know that this is what we want to be a patient to grow old with but what we face in daily life is situations like this what we do know is that this is due to external factors but what kind of external factors and how do we need to approach this? How can we create awareness with a patient that they are having problems or that they are facing problems that can, um, can come in the future? What I personally like is the holistic way of approach. And the holistic way of approach is that we do want the patient to realize that there are factors in their lifestyle, in their habits, that are due to things like this. But not only that, we also need to create awareness of how a dentist can change um, the way the force balance is to prevent things like this. Because sometimes it's multifactorial. So you have to be um, so you have to know what's the underlying cause of these things. And I will come further on it and tell you this and tell you how we do approach things like this. After one year of working in a dental practice, in a general dental practice, I've got to ask myself the question all the time, why do get fillings loose? Why do they break? Why do patients have declarable or undeclarable pains? What's the cause that the, these things sometimes happen complicated or sometimes are uncomplicated? And so in the last past seven years, I got the chance to specialize myself. And what I wanted to know is that if I'm going to have a patient like this and I'm going to give them a treatment, would this help this patient to get rid of all these problems? And would it be a long-term solution? I wouldn't know. But what I did know is that after one year working in the general practice with Heindebond, that opened a lot of doors for me, um, I got to work with the royal dentist in Holland, Hans Beetmans, and he learned me that whatever I do, I need to do it with microscopic precision. Because if I use precision, I know what I am doing. 
But from that small part of view, I got the chance to work with Schwarzmakens. And Schwarzmakens treats patients from a reconstructive point of view. So what you do is microscopic and helicopter view and put these things together. So what they all learned me is that what we do in daily life when we treat patients in a general practice is most of the time only causing or only treating the symptoms. And instead of treating the symptoms, we have to have a look at the broader view. What is causing all these problems? Because it's very, very important that they learned me that we need to be in a very fast stadium to signalize all these problems. Like the first picture that I showed you, when a patient comes in like that with such nice lobes and you make your pictures or you do your scanning or whatever you do or make impressions and you follow that process in the upcoming years, you can signalize problems like this, that from a, uh, from a very fa uh, fast stadium. So this patient came into my practice uh, approximately one, one and a half year ago. And what I do in uh, my practice is always make like a standardized uh, photography, uh, photography uh, series. And next to that, I also have like a questionnaire because I think it's very important that the patient get awareness of the situation in their mouth. Sometimes they don't have any pain. Sometimes they don't have any problems and they don't have any questions. But you do signalize things. And when you use a questionnaire like that, you are getting or creating awareness with the patient because you, from their underli underlying no knowledge, they do know that sometimes they do have some pains or inconvenience. And when you have a questionnaire like that, it comes up and they, they recognize it. In this case, the patient came in with a question that he didn't like his teeth anymore. He just wanted an aesthetical treatment. But we all know that when we only treat this from an aesthetic point of view, maybe in a later stadium or in a later state, it will fail. Because you also have to have a look at the functional sites with patients. So what's very important is make your pictures. Because when you're going to discuss things like this with your technician, you need to know where you start and what your endpoint going to be. So in this case, you can see that it's very, very important for your planning to have a look, how do the teeth stand right now? As you can see here, this patient has a lot of wear. So there's, there has been dental alveolar compensation in this case. We can also see in the anterior port that there's a retrusion of the ant, uh, anterior, uh, uh, anterior centrals. There's a uh, restricted envelope of function. And you need to discuss these things with the patient. Are you going to relieve it? Aren't you going to relieve it? What are the key elements for you uh, to have a look at? So with your pictures, you can also um, show your patient the leakage of fillings. For example, the amalgamon. And then you make your x-rays, your runcheon evaluation, and then you can already see that there are some problems in the left lower jaw. But when the patient comes back after a few months, you already see that the crown comes loose. What happened there? You already predicted it. You already discussed it. So they have this aha awareness. She told me, now it happened. And as I told, it's very important with your patient to discuss what are you going to do? Because when he's got a restricted envelope of function, is that your end situation where you want to start? Is it a risk that you want to take? In this case, I discussed with him, maybe it's better to do either conventional orthodontics or Invisalign. But because both of them took a, too much time, he didn't want that. So I had to grab my chances with maybe an in-man aligner or the clear, uh, the clear aligners. And the clear aligners and the in-man aligners only focus on the anterior port. So what we did is relieve the restricted envelope and at least relieve the crowding in the lower jaw. And it looks like this, because when you see it looks like this, 
you do your IPR and your PPR, and your IPR and your PPR means that you make some interproximal reduction for the teeth to move. And uh, your IPR is rounding up everything so that they can move uh, next to each other. And then after you've done your orthodontic treatment, you need to do, again, your uh, facial analysis. Because it's very important because you already uh, changed the position of the teeth. You need to discuss with the patient how much gum do you, uh, uh, do you want to see. In this case, you already see the patient doesn't show any gum, but sometimes you have patients with a gummy smile. These are all things that you need to be aware of. How much do you want to lengthen those teeth? How do you want to, uh, the form to become? What's the length width ratio of this patient? How do the lips act? Uh, what's the length of the lip? Etc. And that's kind of questions you need to ask yourself and discuss with the patient. So you have the initial situation like this and you make your pictures. And then from this point of view, you have to have a look. How much do I want to lengthen these teeth? What I do most of the time is take some old composite and just put it in place and just have a look approximately how I want the technician to um, lengthen those in the wax up. So then I can tell the technician the uh, length of the central right one is approximately eight or is eight millimeter, but I want you to lengthen it until 10 or 10 and a half because the width ratio has uh, a standard and the length ratio. As we know, there are standards for length width ratio. So you're going to um, use those for the right amount for the technician to uh, put on. So what's very important is that we, uh, that we also understand what we are asking the uh, technician. Because it's very important that we can transfer the information that we have to the laboratory. And that when we transfer the information that we have to the laboratory, that they do understand what we're asking them. So it's very important for yourself that you ask yourself, do I want to treat this patient in a maximum occlusion? Or am I going to treat this patient in a central relation? And in this case, I use, uh, I use the leaf gouge. But you can also use a COIS-D programmer or a JIG in advance before you uh, register the central relation. It doesn't matter what you use, but it is important that you know uh, that what you're using works in your hands. Next to that, I always do my uh, baseball registration. And also in this case, we know that there are lots of baseball, uh, baseballs in, in the market. And here I use the Artex baseball, but we know that the Coist Dental Facial an uh, Analyzer is also very good. What I do in these kind of cases, after I've done my questionnaire, asking about habits, asking about food, asking about uh, function, uh, having a look at their function, having a look at what's um, already done in the past and uh, their experiences in the past. Like I said, I use the COIS questionnaire. Um, I uh, do my uh, central relation registration. I do my Facebook registration and I um, make the pictures and then I make a small movie. And then it's very, very important to make the right impressions because the better your impressions are, the better the wax up your um, laboratory can um, make. 
Um, but what we do know is that we have scanners on the market right now as well, and those are precise. So if you do have any uh, possibility to use a scanner, I would advise you to do that too. And then we send everything to the laboratory uh, with our reference points, and then we ask the laboratory to make a wax up, and we get this back. And when we get this back, we test it in the mouth of the patient. And when we test it in the mouth of the patient, we make uh, we have some silicone indexes we get from the uh, laboratory. And with those uh, silicone indexes, we are uh, testing the new situation. So what's it going to be with the patient in his mouth? And um, so with the pictures and with a new video, we can show the patient the before situation and the after situation. And with the photos and the videos, we can... Um, uh, control what we did ask the technician and whether the technician uh, transferred it into a right situation what we asked them. So what you can see in the movie is that it's all already almost natural for him um, uh, to get used to this new situation. So when the patient um, wants to go through with the, uh, the rest of the treatment and when he's okay, uh, we make some silicone indexes for a cell uh, from the uh, wax up. And when, with these uh, silicone indexes, we can control how much we did remove from the teeth uh, during our uh, treatment, during our preparation. So we have another uh, silicone index we also use from an uh, occlusal view uh, to have a look if we have uh, given the laboratory enough space. What's very important in these kind of cases is that you discuss in advance with your laboratory how much space they need because some laboratories do have a lot of knowledge and experience. Those labs can create veneers from 0 0.3 or maybe 0 0.4. But you also have laboratories that don't have that much experience and those need some more uh, space. So this, that, discuss this with uh, your lab in advance or your uh, technician. And then when you didn't put your uh, mock-up yet, you can already measure how much space you already have and how much you need to uh, remove. So with the silicone index, you can already see, I do have some space on the central ones. So, and on the incisal, at least I have enough. I don't have to remove in this case. What we do know in these kind of cases, that a natural tooth uh, from the incisal part to the approximately middle part has um, a thickness of enamel between one and two millimeter. Uh, from uh, the middle part, approximately one-third to two-third is between 0 0.6 and, uh, and 1. And then the cervical part is approximately between 0 0.3 and 0, 0 0.6. In this specific case, you already see that there's a lot of wear. And because that there's a lot of wear, you already know that at the cervical part, you don't want to remove that much. Because the more you're going to remove, the faster you're going to get into the dentin. And you, we all know that um, stitching to the dentin is always weaker than stitching or bonding to the uh, enamel. So we're starting from this point because we always want the end point in, to have in mind. So this is our starting point. And from this point, we reduce. We firstly, ah, before I'm going to tell you, um, this, is my, uh, this is the kit you can buy anywhere. It's a random kit, and I think a lot of dentists already made kits like this. You can just buy them with your supplier. And what I love about this kit is that they are made special for uh, indirect restoration. 
Uh, this one's special for veneers, but you can also use them for the posterior parts. And what I love is the depth cutter. The depth cutter um, guides you for at least a deep uh, a, uh, a depth of 0 0.3 millimeter in the buccal part and in the cervical and uh, incisal part. So it's very important that you know that when you use this depth cutter, you already create 0 0.3 for your laboratory. And then after you've done the rest, you're going to that 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, but you can control this with your silicone indexes. So my starting point is reduce first one millimeter of the uh, incisal part, and then butt joint it with my chamfer. And after I've butt jointed it with my chamfer, I go to the buckle part with my depth cutter. And we all know that every tooth have, has three angles. And so you need to approach all three angles from another point of view. As you can see in the picture, when you're using the depth cutter, you need to use him in these three angles because when you put him on the cervical part, you don't touch the uh, incisal part. But when you put him on the incisal part, you don't touch the cervical part. But you want at least in all three points, the 0 0.3. You only know that the middle part is always the 0 0.3 because in the middle part, it always stays the same. So you can see here in the picture, in real life, when you put it a little bit more towards the incisal part, you see that it gets loose from the cervical part and the other way around. So this is the way it looks like when you've used the depth cutter from the buckle side. And what I do is with a pencil, ah, then afterwards I use my chamfer. What I do with a pencil is uh, draw the lines so that I know when I use my chamfer burr, that I do have to remove at least until uh, the whole pencil uh, stripes are gone, because then I know that I've given the laboratory at least 0 0.3 millimeter. And when I've done that, the same way with the depth cutter, you always have those three uh, angles. So you need to use the three angles with your chamfer as well. So from here, you can see the same point of view also with the chamfer burr, incisal, middle third and cervical part. So when you've done this, you're going to measure all the time in between your uh, burrs, how much space you've given your laboratory. And when you've measured that, you can have a look if it's okay. And if you're satisfied, then you're rounding it, uh, rounding everything up. And what we do know in these kind of cases, is that you don't want any cracks. And we know that if you haven't got any roundup cases and they are too sharp in the baking phase in the laboratory, you create cracks. So the more rounded up the teeth, the less chance of cracks. Uh, what we also know is that a common mistake that we make is that we don't give the laboratory enough incisal space for the translucency. So, in this specific case, you do know, because there's a lot of wear, that you already have given the laboratory enough space. But in some cases that you have, for example, a discolored uh, tooth because of a trauma and an obliteration of the root canal, you don't have to do any uh, root canal treatments because there's not a symptom seen on the apical side of the root, but the patient wants something to be done. So you're going to do facings then at least give your laboratory one to 1.3, depends on what they want, discuss it with them, millimeter for them to create a correct translucency. Then after you rounded up the angles with, the, uh, with your, uh, uh, with your uh, soft leg discs, excuse me, your, uh, what I did in the past is using my uh, brownie. Uh, but nowadays I came back from this because the brownie creates a smear layer first and you need to clean up that smear layer and next to that we all know that it causes warmth and because we know it causes warmth we do know that it can have effect on your probe vitality. So to prevent these kind of things I don't use my brownie anymore. Um, and after I've um, smoothen everything. I'm uh, having a look again with my uh, silicone index if I'm satisfied or not. 
And if I'm satisfied, I'm going to the posterior cord. What you can see here is that I left, further on you will see it, I left the inlay in the seven in its place because it's a reference point for me. And the inlay I thought is still correct. Why do I need to remove this inlay if it's still very good? But what we can see in the amalgam is that there's already chipping some around and you can see some leakage of the amalgam. You can see the discolored uh, edges. So what we decided to do is to remove the amalgam and to place an IDS layer in order to make an indirect restoration. So as you can see here, uh, this is the other side. And again here, what I did is remove the old composites. And nowadays, maybe I would uh, remove the crack on the palatal part of the seven, uh, due to the fact that I know what the biomimetic principles daily are now. And here you can see how it looks like when I make my IDS layer. Um, and after I've done this, um, I'm putting everything under rubber dam because I want to do IDS layers on the dentin in the anterior part as well. So I've, after I've done my IDS layers, maybe something nice to do in another uh, lecture as well, IDS layers. Um, I put my retraction cord and this is the way it looks like. So here you can see from the upper view. And what I always do is use a double cord technique just to be quite sure that when I make my impression, it's everything is seen in the impression. So the impression looks like this, and then I send it to the laboratory. And when I send this to the laboratory, they can um, make the indirect restorations for me. This is the way, uh, by the way, this material is from Dentsply. Uh, it's called Aquasil. And we got the chance to use it through Marco Gresnig that is doing uh, now a research on IDS layers and the effect of it on the, um, uh, the, strength, the strength of your bonding of your indirect restoration. And since we are using this, we are fond of it. Um, here you can see the way the patient goes home with uh, this is Luxotrem from DMG. And then we start the lower jaw. When we do the lower jaw, it's exactly the same way we do the upper jaw. We did the upper jaw. Exactly the same steps, exactly the same approach. And then you see in some parts, you already see that there's some exposed dentin on the cervical part. But we did know in advance that we were going to have this because we didn't increase the VDO in this patient because he really didn't want that. And next to that, we know that we are treating eroded elements. In this case, we knew that the enamel is already very thin because of the erosion. So the chance that we would get into the dentin was very big. Then I register my bites. And after I've registered my bites, I uh, transfer everything to the laboratory and then they make the indirect restoration. They send it back. But before they send it back, they always want to see the patient in the lab for the last baking phase. And they see them approximately for a full upper jaw, of three or four hours. And then the patient brings uh, the full package with them and comes to the practice. And when they come to the practice, uh, we start putting everything under rubber dam. We don't fit all the units before we've uh, placed the rubber dam because uh, we trust the technician. We already work for quite a long time together. And what we do know it, is that they are fitting everything there in the laboratory and they already discussed everything with the patient. So what we do know, what we do is we placed rubber dam. In some cases we use Teflon. In this case, I didn't use Teflon because I knew I was going to treat all the teeth together and place them one by one. And then I sunplast with the AquaCare and Cojet and I rinse it. I, uh, now I do my fitting after I've etched. So I etch it, I do my fitting just to have a look if nothing uh, chipped off or uh, nothing broke uh, during the transport or, or uh, with the laboratory in their, in their uh, fitting uh, session. And after I've done that, I'm going to apply my uh, prime and bond. And after I've applied my prime and bond, this is, this is after priming. Uh, 
uh, still not bonding. Um, I treat my uh, indirect restoration. When I treat my indirect restoration, I use uh, hydrophilic uh, acid uh, between 20 and sec around 20 seconds. Then I neutralize it uh, in water and baking soda. I uh, have a control of whether there's no glaze inside of it. Then I put it in a, how do you call it, uh, ultrasonic clean uh, machine for two to three to five minutes. Then I air dry it, I silenate it uh, with silane and uh, sometimes I'm, I use it in a small warm oven or in my composite warmer. And then I put my bonding on it from uh, OptiBond Avel and I use warmed composite uh, inside of the indirect restoration. Then I put my bonding after I've done my dent, I've done my uh, primer on the two on the dentin. I apply my uh, bonding on the whole tooth and then I bond the teeth. After I've bond the teeth, I uh, always do the first two together to be quite sure that they fit together uh, and um, that I know exactly that they uh, come in their places. Then I apply glycerin gel, as you can see here, uh, to air block the inhibition layer. And then I go further one by one. Uh, only the two central ones I place together and the rest all one by one. So this is the way it looks like. You can see a fine outline. And when you see, uh, uh, as you can see, this is uh, when the whole upper jaw is placed. And this is the way it looks from uh, the occlusal point of view. And then the final pictures, as you can see here. I guess it's quite nice. In first, the patient was very satisfied with its end result. And here are the final thick pictures of his face, the facial ones. And then, um, as you can see here, and I'm going to start to tell you already what the main mistake in this whole case is, is that we treat this patient in a way to deep bite and we didn't increase that video. Here you see some of the last pictures then. And as you can see in this picture, the laboratory and what we did is exactly the same. We copied it exactly. So we know what we started with and we knew what we would end with. And since we didn't do the posterior part in the lower jaw yet, as you can see, um, because of the fact that the patient got the Magagen implant meanwhile, and ah, before I forget to tell you, um, on these pictures you can already see that, the, especially on the seven, that the pulpa horn is very, uh, high. So having a look at the biomimetic principles, I think I didn't approach this teeth the way I had to do. I think I should be more aware of what could happen if I um, removed the old dentin. Maybe I should have left more of the dentin in its place and uh, discuss with the laboratory if they could make more ultra thin uh, veneers. Because what I did, and that's also one of the big mistakes that I did here, is maybe I removed too much because these teeth were symptomless. Why did I cause this problem in this case? I think it's a very common mistake that we all can make, but this made me open my eyes to be more and more aware of how to uh, use the biomimetic principle in daily life, in daily dentistry, to prevent things like this to happen. But then, as I said, we didn't increase the video, the vertical dimension, the vertical occlusal dimension. So after a month, the patient came back uh, telling me that he was satisfied but was disturbed by this point of view. When he had his anterior guidance, he was like, I'm just touching one tooth. 
And what you also can see is that I don't like it, but the patient didn't like it too. The occlusal point of view, the occlusion is like totally incorrect. So what we did is make a new wax up and try that new wax up in the mouth of the patient because we knew that we still had to do the posterior part. We decided together with this patient that maybe it might be a better idea to come to a better end result to remove those six, six anterior facings in the lower jaw and to change it to a new, new situation. Nowadays, I would never make this mistake again because I would tackle it or I would discuss it and be more aware of this problem or Maybe that's not the way I can tell it. I was aware of this problem, but I wouldn't be led by my patient. And in this case, I let the patient to lead me instead of me leading the patient. And I think as a young dentist, this is a common mistake that might happen or occur to, uh, occur to all of us. You're young, you have a new dentist like I have since one and a half year, and you're already uh, very, very pleased that patients like this come into your practice and that you get the chance to treat them. So if you get the chance to treat them and you're planning, sometimes you do concessions that you don't have to, or you're not, you're not, you're not willing to do. So what happened is that we tested this and now we're satisfied with this end result in the lower jaw. So we're going to transfer this new situation in a new situation. Unfortunately, due to Corona, we haven't done this yet, but um, for sure in the, in the upcoming month or in the upcoming two months, when we hear that we can start again here in Holland, uh, we are going to transfer this in this new situation. Um, I hope I could have you um, get into the story and to see what, what my common mistakes were in uh, daily life to show you how I approach a case. And for sure, I forgot a lot of details that I didn't mention or forgot a lot of things that I didn't tell you uh, because I just have these 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, if you do have any questions, please ask me. Uh, by any time, you can reach me by Facebook, Instagram, um, or email me. Uh, please uh, share knowledge with each other and stay safe in these times and be careful. Thank you very much, guys. See you in a later phase.